I've headed the last study, More Relationships, because that's what it's about. The last three chapters of Romans, 14, 15, and 16. Now, relationships within a fellowship are the most acutely in tension when Jews and Gentile believers are meeting together. There are tensions that arise out of something called scruples, hesitations people have because of their conscience, because of their culture, because of their traditional upbringing. We all have them. And there are differences that Paul calls disputable issues. And he means that they are debatable matters, matters not dealt with directly in Scripture and therefore without any clear biblical guidance, but which different people believe is right or wrong. And these tensions are there. I'm going to give you some illustrations of them. I was ordained a Methodist minister uh, way back in 1950s. And in those days, Methodism in Britain made teetotalism a principle. And I had to promise as a Methodist pastor never to touch alcohol. And the Methodists of Britain, at least in those days, they've relaxed it now, were all strongly anti-drink. The Methodist Church in Norway was somewhat different. They had the same attitude to smoking. And anybody who smoked was considered a really bad sinner. The president of the English Methodist Church, as soon as he was out of the pulpit, stuck a pipe in his mouth. And he was an inveterate pipe smoker. And he went on an official visit to the Methodists of Norway. And he horrified them all by sticking his pipe into his mouth. When the president of the Methodist Church in Norway visited Britain on an official visit, the opposite applied. He happily took a drink in moderation. Well, that's a typical example of a disputable issue. There are many others. Should women wear makeup? On the whole, American women seem to have no inhibitions, but I've been to other parts of the world where that's considered extremely sinful. I have two rings. They're both gold, because gold is a metal that doesn't tarnish or rust or anything. And I have my name on both in Hebrew, that one was given to me on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which, as you know, is the wedding day when they marry the law for another year. And I watched a little Jew make it for me in a, a little shop in Jerusalem. And it was our 25th wedding anniversary on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, and we celebrated it with 1,200 Christians in the wilderness of Judea, late at night with a great pillar of fire, uh, a bonfire, and we ate roast quail, and it was a wonderful 25th anniversary, and my wife gave me that on my 25th anniversary, and it has my name in Hebrew, David, on the walls of Jerusalem. And she said, I want you to be a watchman on the wall. And so I like wearing that ring. It's not just a wedding ring. This ring was owned by a Jew many, many, many years ago. And it has my name on it in Hebrew. This time, the other way round. It reads left to right. Can you guess why? It's a signet ring to press into wax. And they were building a big new apartment in London, and they found that in digging the foundations, 
they were digging through a very old Jewish cemetery. And among the bones, they found this ring owned by a Jew called David. And they gave it to me. I was very grateful for it. And I said, I'll wear that till I die and beyond. I want to be buried in those two rings. But I went to Romania, where one of the biggest sins that Christians consider is to wear a gold ring. And I can't get them off. <laughs> so as soon as I began my first preach there, I explained why I wore them. And that it's for the love of Israel in my heart. But there we are. Christians have different scruples depending on their conscience, on their culture. When I went, first went to India, to Hyderabad, for uh, an Indian Christian called Bhakt Singh, we went into a huge convention building that had no seats, just a bare concrete floor. And as we went in, all the people coming took off their sandals, mostly plastic flip-flops, and just threw them into a pile at the door. And then went in, in either bare feet or stocking feet. That's their culture. Well, I had a nice new pair of sandals on, and I thought, when they come out, they just pick up a pair of sandals from the top of the heap and go off with them. I'm afraid, to be honest, I hid them around the corner. But I took my sandals off to go in and worship with them. That's their scruple. And in many countries, you take your shoes off when you go into a house. In Britain, we don't. And we can develop these traditions and get right into the church. Some countries I go to would be horrified that you are sitting male and female side by side. And in every worship, they sit all the f women on one side and all the men on the other side. Uh, when I used to go behind the Iron Curtain, that was invariably the pattern. And uh, they would be horrified that we mix the sexes when we worship God. So this is the kind of disputable issue that Paul is dealing with. When you can have strong convictions either way, and when these come together in the same fellowship, you've got a problem. And this particularly applies in a fellowship of Jews and Gentile believers together. And since Paul's whole letter is about this tension in which the Gentiles of the Roman church were having difficulty welcoming the Jewish believers back again under Nero after Claudius had sent them away from the city. And Paul is dealing with that. He now deals with the very practical side of it. And the two issues which he calls disputable are diet and days. And of course, in this case, the Jewish culture has much stronger convictions than the Gentile culture. Kosher food is a very strong thing with the Jewish culture. And there was the added problem of the fact that most meat available in Rome had been slaughtered and offered to the gods before it was sold. And the question was, meat offered to idols? Christian can't eat that. And so there was a difference of opinion on diet. In this case, vegetarianism. And there are Christian vegetarians today who don't seem convinced by Genesis 6, or rather 9, where God gave permission to us to eat meat, which has not been rescinded. Nevertheless, there are Christians who genuinely believe that Christians shouldn't eat animals that have been killed for their consumption. So vegetarianism 
such an issue. And the other issue was special days. Now, for the Jew, the Sabbath, Saturday, is a special day. Some Christians have thought that it's now been changed and that the Christian Sabbath is on Sunday, the day of the resurrection. But they have a Sabbatarian attitude to Sunday. I was brought up in a godly family, but Sunday was the Sabbath to them. And therefore, I was not allowed to use a bicycle or a camera on Sunday. And this became a sinful thing. Caused quite a crisis when I went away to work on the farm and the nearest church was five miles away. And I had to ride a bicycle from the farm to the church just to attend worship. And the first time I got on a bike on Sunday, my background made me face up to that. Am I free to ride a bike on Sunday? And I came to the conclusion after studying the Bible, yes, of course I am. But I had to get over that scruple. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about. And the Jewish scruples were, first of all, on food, diet, and secondly, on special days, particularly the Sabbath, that weekly day that was devoted to the God of Israel. And you know what has kept the Jewish identity during all the 2,000 years they've been away from their land are circumcision, kosher food, and the Sabbath. And they've kept up those three basic things which kept their identity wherever they were part of the miracle of their survival. And so even to this day, Jewish believers in Jesus have cultural scruples and uh, there are certain things they won't feel comfortable doing. Now then, how do we deal with a fellowship in which there are strong Christians and weak Christians. The first thing is, we're going to have two surprises here. The first surprise is that the strong Christians are the one who, ones who feel free to do things. And the weak Christians are those who have scruples about doing certain things. So a sign of a strong Christian is someone who's matured and no longer well, can I put it this way? The conscience is like a moral compass. And we're all born with a moral compass called the conscience. But it is conditioned by our upbringing. And it doesn't point to true north. Mind you, no compass ever did. The true magnetic north moves around. It's somewhere near Greenland at the moment, but it moves around. And an aircraft's compass, they've got to allow for the fact that it's not pointing to the North Pole. We assume every compass points to the North Pole. It doesn't. The magnetic north moves around. In fact, at one stage, they tell me it swapped places with the magnetic south. And it reversed. I don't know the truth of that. But the compass is not reliable for true north. And your conscience is not reliable for true morality. It is approximate, depending on your upbringing. And things you were brought up to believe were wrong, that compass in you will point to. Part of maturing as a Christian is adjusting that compass to true north, to the will of God, and to what God has said is right and wrong. And that can take quite a lot of adjustment. I had to learn to ride a bike on Sunday as part of that adjustment. And a mature Christian is much freer than a Christian with a lot of scruples from upbringing or culture and background. Have I explained this enough for you to realize what Paul is dealing with? 
Christians can have very strong convictions because their compass has not been fully adjusted yet to God's will and is still to a degree conditioned by background, upbringing, and so on. So if you were brought up in a church that said Christians don't go to the cinema, that will be part of your compass. And you may mature and feel free to go to the cinema, but you will, if you're mature, decide which films you should see. Do you see what I mean? You're freer, but you've adjusted your compass. Well now, on these two disputable matters, which he is only giving as illustration, he's saying that the strong Christian is the one who's freer to do things than the weak Christian who has this carryover of scruples from background. And the next thing surprising to us is not who is the strong Christian and who is the weak Christian, but who has to do the adjusting. Now you'd think Paul would say the weak Christian with scruples must adjust their lifestyle to the strong Christian who is more mature and freer to do these things. But in fact, he says the opposite. And all of his teaching now is addressed to the strong Christian to adjust his behavior to the weak Christian. Now get that shock into your mind because it is a shock. And if you're not careful, you can damage a weak brother because you override his scruples. In other words, it's the strong brother who's free to do a thing, who is also free not to do it for the sake of his weaker brother. That's the point I'm trying to get across. And it's a bit of a shock to some Christians that Paul expects the strong to adapt to the weak for the sake of harmony within the fellowship. Now I've mentioned the two things he mentions, vegetarianism and Sabbatarianism. And still to this day in England, Sunday observance is an issue among Christians. And we had a big campaign by some Christians recently, well, not so recently, a year or two back, called Keep Sunday Special. And many of the arguments that those who backed that campaign were using were arguments for the Sabbath and Sabbatarianism. And Christians are free from the Sabbath law. The fourth commandment is not applied in the new covenant, but it's often appealed to. And it's appealed to in the name of keeping Sunday special. At the time, I naughtily wrote an article in a national Christian magazine and entitled it, Keep Monday Special, <laughs> and pointed out the scriptural teaching. We are not bound by the Sabbath law of Moses, any more than were bound by the tithing law of Moses. Though more churches try to apply that to Christians and force them to tithe to the church, which of course ensures a good income for the church, but it's not biblical. I've read a very funny book recently called The Year of Living Biblically. And it was written by a Jewish reporter in New York who was not a practicing Jew, though he was married to a Jewess, and he was circumcised, but he wasn't practicing. And he decided as a, a journalistic experiment to live by the Bible for 12 months and report on what happened. And it really is the funniest book you will read. He was deadly serious. 
he had to abandon most of his clothes because they were mixed material. And so he abandoned most of his suits, suits and wore a cotton nightdress virtually to the embarrassment of his whole family. But at least it was one material. And in New York this is, remember, and I think the funniest, if the ladies will excuse this, the funniest was that the Mosaic law that you must be very careful not to have contact with a woman who is in her monthly bleeding period. And he came home one night and he knew his wife was in her monthly period and he was about to sit down in the easy chair by the fire and she said, I have sat in that chair this morning. <laughs> so he jumped up and he moved to another chair. She said, I've sat in that chair too. <laughs> and she had deliberately sat in every chair in the house and the poor man couldn't sit down <laughs> that night. And this is how the book goes on. But he literally, literally tried to do everything Moses had said and everything that Jesus had said. He agreed that that was in the Bible and therefore he was going to live biblically for 12 months. And he just got into such a muddle and such scrapes. I tell you, it's one of the funniest books you can read. His name is Jacob something. Has anybody read this, the book or seen it? You have, yes. Did you find it funny? <laughs> I mean, the, the conclusions he came to at the end of 12 months were, number one, it's quite impossible. And number two, it's a good deal harder to live by the New Testament commands than the Old Testament. That's a very interesting conclusion. And he came to some very clear conclusions. It's a good book to read in your leisure time for a bit of amusement, but it's got a kick in the tail. Now these are matters of scruples now even a Jew who's come into the new covenant is now free from the law of Moses. But one of the most difficult questions that Israeli believers are facing and the fellowships of Israeli believers are almost at war over this is how much of the Mosaic covenant they should keep. They know they're free from it, but somehow they've got a lot of scruples in the new covenant from the old covenant. By the way, the Old Testament is not the old covenant. The old covenant is the Mosaic covenant. The Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic, the Davidic, all those come straight over into the new. They are not the old. The new has replaced the old covenant, but that's only replaced Moses and his law. But I can understand the tension that is arising among Israeli believers these days in Israel. They're not sh quite sure. They meet on the Saturday, if they can, rather than the Sunday. That's part of their belief. And there are Christians who believe that Christians should observe the Sabbath law. They're called the Seventh-day Adventists. And they begin their worship at six o'clock on Friday evening. And I'm afraid I find many Christians, particularly Zionists today, believe that all Christians should be becoming Jewish. And they therefore observe the Jewish Sabbath in a Christian Gentile home. These are all the issues of scruples, disputable issues. And so the exhortation to the strong follows the examples that Paul gives. And the exhortation is don't accuse others. That applies only to disputable issues. Don't accuse them of sinning. Don't judge them, but realize that you will give account for yourself, not them. They are doing it to the Lord, 
and though their conscience isn't yet mature and therefore freer, nevertheless, they are doing it to the Lord. It's their conviction. And the strong who is free not to do that should not judge them and should not condemn them and not look down on them. God is their judge and we should only be accountable to God for ourselves in disputable issues. That's very good advice. He goes on to use a phrase again and again called to the Lord, especially when he's dealing with Sabbatarianism or turning Sunday into a Sabbath. And uh, if you want to know the new covenant fulfillment of the Sabbath, it's resting from your own works every day of the week. And so Paul says in a fellowship there are some who believe that one day is special to the Lord and others believe that every day is to the Lord. There's a tension. Don't judge each other. Just make sure that you are convinced in your own mind and that you are respons responsible to the Lord. It's he who should have the last word in such disputes. And when we answer to the Lord on the day of judgment, we won't answer for anyone else, just ourselves. And we need constantly to remember that. So he now turns to a section which I've labeled disarming manners. Your attitudes are going to make all the difference in such, they can so easily become arguments, even splits. I've known churches split over dancing, makeup, and cinema. And it's tragic when believers split over scruples, which some conscientiously hold to the Lord in their own convinced minds and others are free to do otherwise and it's a question of etiquette. There is such a thing as godly manners in a fellowship where there are such tensions and there are four things in particular that Paul says should mark the strong and their manners towards the weak those with more scruples. First, consideration. Get a true perspective. Get things in proportion. And that's when he says, for the kingdom is not a matter of food and drink. What goes into people's bodies is not a kingdom manner, matter. The kingdom of God is not a matter of what you eat or what you drink. Therefore, arguments about teetotalism or moderate drinking are, in a sense, irrelevant to the kingdom. What does matter in the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. Those are the important things in the kingdom. And I want you to notice carefully the order. Righteousness first, then that brings peace, and then you have joy. And the real crucial principles of the kingdom are really not nothing to do with what you eat or drink. They're to do with your righteousness, your peace, and then your joy in the Holy Spirit. That's worth arguing about. That's important. So get a true perspective. Don't get things out of perspective. Don't enlarge a thing beyond its, its relative unimportance. That's what he means by consideration. And by the way, that's the only mention of the word kingdom in the whole letter. Those who think this is the gospel Paul preached need to think again. He preached the kingdom, but that's the only verse that mentions it in connection with scruples. The next thing is edification. 
The word edifice means building. And edification is to build people up, not to break them down. We're not in the business of demolition. We're in the business of edification. Paul made a lot of that in 1 Corinthians 14. He said, when you go to church, your first consideration is not expressing yourself, but edifying those around you. And what you do in a church should build them up and not break them down. I'm afraid I get a bit allergic to worship leaders that say, now each of you do your own thing. If you want to sit, you sit. If you want to stand, you stand. If you want to kneel, you kneel. And he's breaking up a congregation. I had three children, as I told you, I've still got two. But uh, when they were little, there was a ritual in our family. And the three of them, at an ungodly hour in the morning, would come and stand at the foot of my bed in a straight row and would sing to me. It was, in a sense, artificial because they stood in a self-conscious row and sang this song to me. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday. And there they were singing a song together, standing in a straight row at the foot of the bed. After singing, they would then present me with a bag of their favorite candies. <laughs> it, was a, it was a kind of ritual, and it happened faithfully once every year. Now you could say, wouldn't you rather as a father that they came to you separately and said, we, I love you? And I said, no. In standing in a row together and singing together, they are acknowledging that they are a family and not just my children. Doing a thing together, doing the same thing together, having a ritual together and singing to the Father together. He may enjoy that more than a lot of people doing their own thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you go to church, you do not go to express yourself you go to edify the others. And therefore, you don't do things that will puzzle people. You don't all speak in tongues. That's not going to help everybody there. And therefore, your consideration is, now what should I be doing to help this person next to me? Edification is a Christian duty. Building people up. And if you ride over the scruples of a weaker brother, you are destroying him. You're not building him up, you're breaking him down. The next thing is discretion. You may be free to do something, and the weaker brother may copy you to his own harm because he may be filled with doubts while he's doing it. He will do it because you're doing it, but he's filled with doubt. And whatever is not of faith is sin. And he's doing it out of conformity to you, not out of his faith. And that's wrong. So you don't do it. You become discreet. You keep quiet about your convictions, and you simply adjust your behavior to his. He may be the weaker brother, and you may be the stronger one, but it's up to the stronger to adjust to the weaker. And therefore, discretion is another disarming manner of the strong. And finally, he says, imitation. Imitate Christ. And he quotes a text from the Old Testament, a messianic type text about Christ being willing to be insulted. And in a sense, when you adapt to the weaker brother, you're feeling you're insulting yourself. 
you're sitting on top of a conviction to be free. But you will do it to imitate Christ who bore our insults without complaining. And so, like Christ, we are not to please ourselves. That's what he says. Now, I'm afraid we have got into a culture now in the West and spreading to other parts of the world where we are encouraged to express ourselves, to release ourselves, to concentrate on what I think. Many of the choruses we sing were written for private devotion. They are I songs. And you know, Jesus said, when you want personal prayer, go into a room, shut the door, and say, Our Father. There's really no such thing as private prayer. You are part of a body the world over that's praying, and what you're praying about, somebody else is praying about. So he said, even in private, say, Our Father. Corporate prayer is the normal prayer for a Christian. But so many new songs are I and me and mine, and how I feel about the Lord and how he feels about me. It worries me. It's part of the individualism of the 80s that is still hanging around. We are a corporate people. Most of our songs should be our, we. And I'm just telling about a bee in my bonnet. <laughs> but uh, we need to think of what we're singing. And uh, I can't sing the feelings of somebody else if I don't have them. But many of the great hymns of Charles Wesley, who wrote 6,000 hymns, were packed with scripture and were corporate songs. He did write one or two individual songs, and alas, they're the ones that everybody sings today, like, Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Then I diffused a quickening ray. I rose. The chains fell off. My heart was free. That was his personal experience, but most of his songs are our songs, corporate songs, in which we can all join together and share the same thoughts. So imitate Christ. And his conclusion is, so the strong should bear the weak. The strong who's free to do things should carry the burden of those who don't feel free to do the same thing. That was particularly relevant in Rome so that the Gentile believers would accept the Jewish believers. But it's true of every fellowship. Now we move on in chapter 15, verses 8 to 33, which figures God never intended to be there. And we enter a section which is full of worship. The word worship occurs 11 times in one form or another in the next section. And he's concerned about harmony in worship together so that those Jews and Gentiles will glorify God, verse 6, praise him, verse 7, glorify him, verse 9, praise him, verse 9, sing to him in verse 9, rejoice in him, verse 10, and praise him in the next verse. Eleven times he's got a vision before us of a church that has such harmony between the people that when they worship, it's a corporate exercise of singing harmony, musical harmony, but a harmonious sound to God. And that's the ultimate exercise. However, he has a unique way of mentioning this. He points out what Gentiles owe to Jews. And we need to remember this. 
Many years ago, some of us put up a huge tent in a London park in Finchley because nobody would lend us their building for what we wanted to do. And we put it up and announced that in it we would have an evening for the Jewish people of Finchley. Now, Finchley is almost a Jewish colony now. Most of the Jews who used to live in the poor east end of London have moved to the better off Finchley area of northwest London. And it was Margaret Thatcher's constituency. And we put on a kosher supper for all the Jews who would come. We had about 1,200 finally came. And then we had a meeting. And I spoke and a Jewish rabbi spoke on the time has come for Gentiles to repay their debt to the Jews. That was my subject. And Rabbi Hardman was the rabbi's speaker. And at the end of the meeting, he said to the whole meeting, I was the first Jewish rabbi as a chaplain to the forces to enter Dachau concentration camp. One of the first to be released after World War II. And he's showed us, a, held up a photograph, an enlarged photograph of himself in army uniform as a Jewish chaplain, standing looking down into a mass grave of Jews. And the thin skeletons were piled on top of each other in the grave. And then he said this. He said, tonight is the first night since then when I've had hope. Most moving. And his hope was based on the fact that Christians had done this for the Jews in Finchley. The word of that meeting has gone round the entire Jewish world. Margaret Thatcher sent a special message to us because it was in her constituency. And to this day, I still meet Jews who've heard of that meeting in which I simply said, the time has come for Gentiles to repay their debt to the Jews. Now, one meeting has had an amazing effect. Recordings of it have gone round almost every synagogue. You know, somehow it was like pushing a plug into a socket and finding the socket was live when you pushed it in. It, it sent a shock wave and uh, it's been widely known among Christians. That was back in 1953 or 4. I forget the date. And still they talk about it. And all we did was three of us got together and put on that meeting for Jews in the heart of the Jewish area in London and cooked them a kosher meal. <laughs> now we could have said Christians are free to eat anything. Even Peter was told rise and eat and was told all foods are, unclean, are clean to the Christian. We could have emphasized that to them, but we didn't. We laid on a kosher meal for them. It was an example of the strong adjusting to the weak. And it had that effect worldwide. Well, now Paul makes two points that the Gentiles owe to Jews. And the first point is, Christ was a servant to the Jews. Spent his whole life going to Israel. When on two occasions he got outside Israel, he healed a Gadarene demoniac in one occasion and a Syrophoenician woman's child in another. And he said to the Syrophoenician woman, 
it's not right to take food meant for the children and give it to dogs. He was testing her to see what faith she had, and she came up with a brilliant retort. And she said, but even the puppy dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall from the table. <laughs> and he realized what faith she had and healed her child. A wonderful story. But those are only two rare occasions when he sent out the disciples. They were not to go but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And it looked as if Jesus came just for Jews. And all his ministry was limited to the Jews with a few solitary exceptions. But at the end of his life, he told his 12 Jewish disciples, now go and make disciples of all the ethnic groups, all the ethne, all the nations. And he sent them to the Gentile world. It still took Peter a long time to learn that, but he learned it. And then Paul, that Jewish Jew, was sent as an apostle to the Gentiles. In other words, Jesus had the Gentiles in his heart all along. He came as a Jew to the Jews. But his objective was to fulfill the promises made to the patriarchs. And he promised them, promised Abraham that he'd be the father of many nations and of kings of nations. And Jesus came to fulfill that promise. But he did it by concentrating on Jews in his lifetime. And then after he rose from the dead, he said, now go and share that with the whole world to the uttermost parts of the earth. Don't try and do it without the Holy Spirit power, but wait for that. And then go to the uttermost parts of the earth and share it. That's how much Gentiles owe to the Jew Jesus. And then Paul himself describes himself as the priest to the Gentiles. So not only did Jesus come to confirm the promises to the Jews, but his ultimate objective was to convert the Gentiles. And Paul now shares his strategic mission to the Gentiles. And he's a Jew. And the Gentiles he's led to the Lord all owe to him, a Jew, to bring them the liberating gospel. And he then talks about what he's done and what he's already yet to do. He said, I've already done my mission in the east of the Mediterranean. Am I right? Is that east to you? Yes. And then he said, I'm going to do the west of the Mediterranean. His ambition, he says, is to preach where Christ is not known. And now he's known in the east of the Roman Empire because I've done it. He didn't say because I've done it. He was humble enough to say, this is what the Lord has accomplished through me. It was the Lord's work through him. Now he tells how he did it. And I want you to take special note of this. There were three dimensions to his mission wherever he went. And they are word, deed, and sign. And you can find all those carefully mentioned in Romans 15. That's true New Testament evangelism. Preaching the word, practicing the deed, doing good, yes, and above all, sign, signs and wonders. And you're not into New Testament evangelism until you are doing all three. That makes a mighty impact. I'll tell you, the real impact on the Muslim world will be through signs, particularly healing in the name of Jesus. I went to a church, this meeting in Manchester in the middle of London, 
And I was amazed. Almost the entire congregation looked Muslim, mostly Arab or Pakistani. And I said to the English pastor, how on earth did you get all these? Well, I asked him first, are they ex-Muslims? He said, yes, almost every one of them. I said, how did you get them into church? And he said, well, we have a simple method. We have people in every street around here who tell us when a Muslim falls ill and calls the doctor. And he said, as soon as we hear that a Muslim is ill, we go and knock on the front door. We don't take Bibles. We don't take tracts. We just say to them, we've heard that someone here is sick. We'd like to come and pray for them if you would welcome that. He said, in every case, they welcome it. And before they go in, they say, we shall be praying to Isa, which is their name for Jesus, because he has the healing gift. And they say, well, still come in and you pray for the sick. And he said, we go in, pray for the sick, they're healed. And then they're asking, who was that that came to our house and healed our relative? And he said, they start coming to our church. The church meets in a former nightclub, and unfortunately they haven't redecorated it yet. You can guess what it, you can guess what it looks like, black walls and red lights and all sorts of things. They've certainly removed some of the pictures. But I thought, here's an English pastor in an ex-nightclub, and it was obviously that. And he's managed to fill a church with about 120 ex-Muslims. And all he's done is, can we come and pray for the sick? He said, no one's refused yet. And then when they see the miracle, the sign, they come to church and they hear the word. I'm, I haven't time to tell you another story along that line but I'm convinced that an evangelism that is only word will not convert the Muslim or perhaps anybody else. It needs to be backed up by the deed, the way you live, and the sign that you are the servant of a supernatural God. And I plead with you to consider this as New Testament evangelism. Word, deed, and sign. And Paul says, I preached the word, saw my deeds, even as a tent maker they saw them. And the signs followed. That's what Jesus told us to do. Go and preach the word with signs following. Demonstrate the kingdom before you try and declare it. That's what Jesus said to the twelve when he sent them out two by two. Go into a town, demonstrate the kingdom, and then tell them the kingdom's come to your town. And I think nothing short of signs and wonders will really have impact in the Muslim world. I'll move on. Not only was this how he did it, but he then says where he did it, from Jerusalem to Illyricum. Illyricum is in the Balkans. It's on the uh, eastern shores of the Aegean Sea. And he said, I've done it, I've done the whole district. Now, what was he doing in the district? The answer is very clear. His objective was to plant a church in the key city of an area or a state and then leave and leave that church to evangelize that whole region. That was his strategy. Brilliant. And so he says, I, I've finished the work in the eastern Mediterranean, right up to Rome. But he says, I'm going on to Spain from you I'm going to do the same in the western part of the Mediterranean Empire that I've done in the east. 
plant a church in the key city and they can do the rest. Don't try and do it all yourself. Plant a church in a key city and leave them to do it. Leave them equipped to do it. But leave a church that can grow and spread by itself. That was Paul's missionary method and it was very good. And so he planted these churches in cities like Ephesus and Thessalonica and Athens and Corinth. And then he moved on and considered his work done. Amazing. And he said, but yet to do west of Rome, Rome then Spain. But there's another uh, intervention here. He says, I'm on my way to Jerusalem first. And I'm taking money that Gentiles have given for Jewish believers. That's an interesting little sidelight on the Jewish-Gentile issue. He's saying Gentiles elsewhere are giving me money for the Jewish believers in Jerusalem who are suffering and need more money. And so he said, I can't come to Rome straight away. I'll have to come after Jerusalem when I've delivered the gift. And then he finishes by asking for their cooperation. He says, I expect a struggle in Jerusalem. He said, I want you to join with me in praying that I may be delivered from the unbelieving Jews. He didn't realize what it was going to mean, but when he got to Jerusalem, it caused a Jewish riot. And he had to be rescued by soldiers, Roman soldiers, from the riot. But he asked the Gentiles, believers in Rome, pray for me, join with me in my struggle. And he asked them also to pray that the Jewish believers in Jerusalem would welcome him, because that was a doubtful proposition as well. They had not welcomed Paul when he was first converted. They were very suspicious of him. And they were even more troubled when he started bringing Gentiles in without circumcising them and without putting them under Moses' law. So there was a lot of suspicion of Paul both from believing Jews and unbelieving Jews in Rome. And so he asks the Gentile believers of Rome to join in praying that he would not have trouble with the unbelieving Jews and, and be delivered from them as he was, and that he would also be welcomed by the believing Jews as he was. And their prayers had a place in that. Of course, he said, I'm looking forward to coming and seeing you in Rome. I want to come in joy and be refreshed. Little did he dream he'd come chained to a Roman soldier and be under house arrest. Nevertheless, God brought him to Rome and fulfilled his ambition to visit that place. Of course, we don't know what happened at his first trial in Rome. Tradition said he was released and did manage to go further west in his mission, which may have happened. The book of Acts closes with his first trial. And it's interesting that the book of Acts exactly parallels the Gospel of Luke. Of course, it had the same author. And this was simply volume one and volume two. Both uh, begin with Mary. Both books uh, begin with the disciples and then the first opposition. And they go all the way through Jesus' life again up to his trial. And then it stops. There's no account in Acts of the death of Paul. 
up to then, the theme of Acts is, in the gospel, all that Jesus began to do and to teach, he's now continuing with another body, the church. And I commend to you, put the two books together and see how remarkable parallel they are. In each case, Jesus went through three trials. Paul went through three trials. In all cases, his judges had to admit that he was innocent, as Pilate did with Jesus. It stopped short of Paul going to his death. He did go to his death. He was probably released from the first trial. The book of Acts was written for his judge. Both the gospel of Jesus in Luke and the book of Acts were written for one man. And he tells us who the man was in both books. The former treatise, O Theophilus, I wrote for you. And he calls him the most honorable. He uses the title of a judge. And I think that while Dr. Luke was in Caesarea while Paul was there, he wrote his gospel about Jesus. And then when he followed him to Rome, Paul was still in prison, but he wrote the book of Acts. And that is why you get such a long section at the end of Acts about the shipwreck in Malta. It's exactly the kind of detail that someone would include and even enlarge to defend a man on trial for his life. And Luke clearly wrote both books to defend uh, Paul at his trial. And so he was explaining for the judge, first of all, where this new religion of Christ began, and his second volume, how Paul had come to be included. That's why there's more about Paul in the book of Acts than any of the other apostles. It's the defense of Paul. And the final defense of Paul is to say to the judge, this man was shipwrecked and he saved the entire crew and he saved the soldiers guarding him. That's a good plea to a judge. And it's almost as if Luke signs off the book of Acts with the words, the case rests, Your Honor. <laughs> he is defending Paul in both books, but God must have been very pleased because he saw both books as part of his word and without Acts and without Luke, we would have lost so much. We'd never have heard the parable of the Good Samaritan or the parable of the prodigal son, but Luke put these together as accurately as he could as only a doctor could, who is used to being accurate in diagnosis and reports. And this doctor wrote this for one man, Theophilus, one of Paul's judges, at his first trial. And everything in those two books can be explained by their the briefs for the defense almost. Well, that's Paul. Join me in my struggle. So we turn to chapter 16. Don't dismiss this chapter. Many Christians have done and say it's just a list of names. It's just greetings. There's no message here. But there's a profound message. And I'm going to tell you what it's all about. Now he's talking about the relationship between near and far, between Christians in one church and Christians in many churches. This is a wider relationship now. Some of the earliest manuscripts of Rome, Romans don't include chapter 16. 
Alas, some early Christians thought it had no message and therefore cut it off and said, it's not relevant to today. We don't know any of these people personally, so what's the point of including that in the Word of God? And they cut it off. Fortunately, we have the full manuscript of what Paul did write, and it included chapter 16. It's the longest list of greetings in the New Testament. He was used to giving greetings of two or three at the end of a letter, but here there are far, far more, a whole chapter full, and most of them are Jews. When the Christian creed includes the phrase, I believe in the communion of the saints, it's pointing to this belief that we not only need right relationships within our local church and its scruples and its different races and different colors, we need relations with churches out there. Paul prayed for churches he'd never been to. He prayed for Christians he'd never met. He had a network which was worldwide. And this final chapter tells us about the network. And a key to that wider network was greetings. We have come here this week from many countries we have not met each other, most of us, before. I hope you're bringing greetings to each other. That you're building a network that's wider than the work you've come from. The example is here. There are three sections to this final chapter. First of all, the sections, greetings to. That means that Paul is asking that his greetings be passed to the people he knows in Rome. And there are three quite surprising elements to the list. The first is the number of women in his list of greetings. Ten. Now this is the answer to those feminists who don't like Paul because they believe he was a misogynist. Nothing of the kind. Paul valued women. And he mentions so many of them, ten of them, in the list. That's a high proportion. I'm afraid the feminists think Paul was a woman hater. Nothing of the kind. He had a very large place in his heart as well as in the work for the women who had been his colleagues. The very first, Phoebe, was the woman who brought the letter all the way from Corinth to Rome. And had she not been faithful with that, we'd never have had these Bible studies this week. Phoebe, a deaconess, the word means servant of the church. An elder is an overseer of the church, a deacon or deaconess is a servant of the church. And she was a wonderful servant as well as a postman. Then look at some of the other names. Priscilla, do you know the word means old-fashioned? <laughs> Hope there are no Priscilla's here that I've offended. <laughs> but um, she was called old-fashioned by her parents, presumably. <laughs> What a name to give a girl. I'm tempted to add that the word, um, oh no, I've forgotten the name now. Perhaps it's just as well. Um, but Priscilla was from the top social bracket and was a team with her husband. They're always mentioned together. A real team for the Lord. Then there are people like uh, Mary, Junius, Trifius, and Trifosa. Names like that always indicate twins. When they had twins in those days, they gave them very similar names, either with the first or last part exactly the same. So Trifena and Trifosa were twin girls, 
twin women, Persis, Rufus' mother. Now there we've got a connection with the man from Cyrene who carried the cross of Jesus when Jesus fell. Rufus' mother, Julia, Nearest sister, ten women altogether. Phoebe, by the way, must have had a pagan background because the word is the word of the moon goddess. So she came from a pagan family, but now is a great help to Paul, a support, a standby, that's the word. It's the same word that is used of the Holy Spirit translated quite wrongly, comforter in many Bibles. It means stand by. Someone will stand by you when you're in trouble. And that's a name here. What a lovely name. The next surprise in this list is that many of these were Paul's physical relatives. Paul had been used to evangelize his own family. Do you know that Jesus' 12 disciples, at least five and possibly seven, were his own physical relatives? Jesus himself began with his relatives. That's why he was found at the wedding of Cana, where he was invited with some of his disciples. They were relatives. Andronicus and Junius were relatives of Paul. And so was, no, the, those two. Herodian was a relative of Paul, named after King Herod, apparently. Now then, apart from the relatives, there were his colleagues people who were served in Christ, in the Lord, with Paul in his work. Now most of these would be Jews who'd come back to Rome when they were allowed to under Nero. And now he says a shocking thing. He says, kiss them. Now when you read the words, greet them with the holy kiss, did you feel the shock? These are Gentile believers who have begun to think that the Jews were rejected by God and that they've replaced the Jewish people. And Paul says, give them a kiss. What? Kiss the Jews? Yes, kiss them. It's a shock, isn't it? Electric shock. I can imagine when, when this letter was read in Rome, as it would be, it wouldn't be duplicated and circulated. It would be read aloud right through to the church in Rome. And when it got to this, kiss them. I can see them looking at each other. Now it's to be a holy kiss. I think I said earlier that the difference between a kiss and a holy kiss is two minutes. But I can tell you better by telling you what an un, 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 unholy kiss is. Judas Iscariot gave Jesus an unholy kiss. And while he was actually kissing Jesus, he was betraying his best friend to death. That's an unholy kiss, which has gone down into history. Everybody knows about that kiss and Judas. But this time it's to be a holy kiss. The next section, verses 17 to 20, he gives a warning about who not to welcome. It's important that a church should welcome many, but not welcome some. There's a discipline about entering a church and some people should be avoided. He says, these are the people who cause division among you. Don't welcome them. 
avoid them. They do it by deception, smooth talk and flattery. The little letter of Jude warns us about people who worm their way into the fellowship and spoil it. And I'm afraid that's one of the dangers that every church must watch. People, when you build a successful fellowship, people will come in and take it over for themselves if they can. I have seen that happen in so many cases. Some of the new fellowships in Britain got off to a good start and then later people joined. They came in and they divided it. Don't welcome everybody. Be wise about who you welcome and say, come on in. Now, how do you defect them? How do you deal with them? How do you avoid that? Well, the answer is to be two things. To be wise about good things and innocent about evil things. That's almost an echo of wise as serpents, harmless as doves, which Jesus put it. So don't welcome everybody. Be careful who you welcome into your fellowship. Kiss those Jews, but give these people the right boot of fellowship. You heard me there, did you? Give them the right boot of fellowship. Some of you didn't understand that, I think. Let's move on. The third section are greetings from. These are greetings from where Paul is writing the letter to the church at Rome. The first group of greetings were to the people in Rome that he knew and probably who had told him that they weren't welcome back. I think Aquila and Priscilla probably put him in the picture about this tension in the church of Rome. But now he's giving greetings from where he is to where they are. Again, he mentions colleagues. Timothy was his young man whom he'd mentored and trained. His apprentice, if you like. Paul had Timothy, who was a, a timid man, a shy young man. And Paul had to teach him how to be bold, and how to stir up the gift that was in him. But Paul had done very successfully with Timothy. He'd even circumcised him because Paul could adapt. And though he preached against circumcision, he circumcised young Timothy so that he could go into Jewish homes freely and evangelize Jews. So Paul was adaptable. And he mentions Tertius. Tertius was the man who wrote Romans, the man who wrote it down. And I can imagine what a headache he had after Paul striding up and down in the room and dictating the whole of Romans nonstop. And reading it through nonstop is quite a task. But this man had to write it down. And he was feverishly scratching away with a pen while Paul said, now write this, now this. Ah, oh, yes, must mention that. And the poor Tertius kept up with them and gave us Romans. Thank you, Tertius, for giving us this letter and writing it down for us. Relatives of Paul are mentioned again. He had relatives everywhere. And he mentioned three of them, Lucius, You'll find all about him in Acts 13. Jason, you'll find all about him in Acts 17. Sopiter, you'll find all about him in Acts 20. These are not just names. These are people who played a part in the spread of the gospel. And when you know other scriptures, you find out their stories. By the way, there was one name, Eponetus, in the first list of greetings, who was Paul's first con convert in Asia. What an amazing thing, the very first one. 
And then there's a man called Amplius. And you know that quite recently, an archaeologist was digging in an ancient cemetery on the outskirts of Rome and came across his grave. That's the only thing I know about him, but I think that's interesting, isn't it? Just a name, but they found his grave now. We'll go back to the greetings from colleagues, Timothy, Tertius, relatives again, Lucius, Jason, Sopiter, all mentioned in the book of Acts, and officials. It's interesting that they did get some of the top people. They had the city treasurer of Corinth, a man called Erastus, city's director of public works great when somebody who's prominent in the public eye and who's got a responsible position in civic life comes to Christ. But there were very few in those days. Not many noble, not many wise were called. God likes ordinary people. Seems to have a preference for a majority of ordinary folk like us. So there were officials. Gaius was obviously a wealthy and prominent citizen whose house was large enough for a church to meet in. So it must have been quite a large house. And these are noblemen, we would call them. The brother of Erastus, the city's director of public works, was another, Quantus. It's a fascinating list. And if you get my book on Romans, which, by the way, was written from sermons preached 20 years ago, and all I've taught you did not come from that book. When I knew I had to come and teach Romans here, I scrapped the book and started from scratch. And I've been preparing these talks for the last four months. I'm just telling you that so that you'll buy the book as well <laughs> and you'll get some different thoughts in that. I was amazed when I began to look at Romans again four months ago, how fresh it came and what new thoughts I had. I had no new thoughts that contradicted the thoughts of 20 years ago, but oh, it came as fresh. And that's the only book I have, and I've got three tons of them, which I've got to give away in the next six weeks. But nevertheless, I find that the one book that you can read again and again and again for a whole lifetime, and still it's fresh, yeah. still it's new. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost as if you're reading it for the first time again. Do you know any other book like that? I don't. So, I'm going to finish where Paul finished with a doxology. That's the word for praise to God. He's already had one doxology here in um, Romans chapter 11. Remember, for from him and through him and to him, giving glory to God there, but now he does it again. A doxology is when you give glory to God simply for what he is. Not so much for what he does, but for what he is. And the three things that Paul finishes by praising God for are first that he is able, his ability to establish us to make us firm and strong and immovable. He's an able God. And that little word able is used again and again in the New Testament. He's able to complete the work that he's begun in you. We've got an able God. And he's able to do everything he plans and everything he's promised. He's not only able, but he's open to us. He reveals mysteries to us. He loves to share secrets with us. 
that the human mind would never have been able to guess. We've heard things in this very letter that no human could ever have discovered with the most brilliant brain in the world, but God has shared the secret. The secret that Israel as a whole will come to God in the end. That's a secret. Nobody would have guessed that. And the final thing, that he's the only wise God. That doesn't mean there are lots of other gods who are foolish. But it's just saying he's the wisest God of all. He's the only wise God. Now, what does that mean? A wise person knows what is the right thing to do and who does it. That's my simple definition. He knows the right thing to do and the right way to do it. That's wisdom. And he's willing to share that with us too, but he's the only wise God knows exactly what's the right thing to do and the right way to do it. So to him be glory forever and ever. And ever and ever. And ever and ever. Amen.